Hello, I'm Dr Alice Banks from Imperial College London and today I'm going to be presenting some of the work that we're doing on microbial degradation and upcycling of polyethylene terephthalate, known as PET, plastic. So today's use of plastics has become a global problem and in recent years the impact that plastics are having on the environment has received significant media attention. Here we can see some of the more frightening statistics relating to global plastic use, which have been compiled by the UN. And if major steps are not taken to address this crisis, then we're likely to face really devastating environmental consequences in the not so distant future. Polyethylene terephthalate, also known as PET, is one of the most widely used types of plastics and it's therefore one of the major contributors to plastic waste and subsequent plastic pollution. PET is a relatively new material. It was initially produced in the 1940s and was then adopted more widely by the food and drinks industry in the 1960s. The wide use of PET stems from its great versatility as a durable and long-lasting polymer. And these desirable material properties have led to the widespread use of PET as a packaging material, particularly in the food and drinks industry and it's also commonly used in single-use packaging products. Additionally, PET um, is a common material in the manufacture of carpets and fibres and other clothing materials. The structure of PET um, is comprised of ethylene glycol and terephthalic acid repeating monomer units. And if these monomers can be recovered from post-consumer PET waste, then they can be channeled into a range of different applications. And these may include the production of new bioplastics or use as an alternative carbon source. Unfortunately, the desirable properties that make PET such a versatile material also cause its long-term persistence in the environment. And natural degradation of PET is estimated to take many hundreds of years. For this reason, it's imperative that efforts are made to reduce the amount of PET waste that enters the environment. But one benefit of PET is that it is highly recyclable and the recycling process is less energy intensive than producing new materials derived from crude oil. However, local refuse collection and recycling services are not always set up to ensure that all PET waste enters the recycling stream as it should. And the recycling process can be further complicated if plastic products are made from a mix of polymers for example, if additives or plasticizers or dyes have been included into these materials. So for example, here we have um, meats packaged in two different types of plastic packaging. One's black and one is clear. The black packaging is much more difficult to recycle. It is actually commonly used to um, package meat products as it disguises the color of blood. But the same product packaged in a clear packet is far easier to recycle although it may be perceived as less appealing to the consumer. But as a result of inadequate recycling, a high proportion of post-consumer pet waste ends up as landfill, and this contributes to the pollution found in lands and in the ocean. There are several ways in which the use and disposal of pet impacts climate change, and as I mentioned previously, the use of mixed plastics and inadequate recycling practices result in a considerable amount of pet waste ending up in landfill. It's not uncommon for landfill to be burnt as a means to generate energy and this burning process causes the release of toxic gases which are both harmful to human health and also key contributors of climate change. Any plastic waste which fails to be recycled or to enter landfill is likely to end up entering the environment. Plastics which are found polluting the land and oceans have direct impact on the structure of these ecosystems and the flora and fauna inhabiting them. But an added concern is that long-term exposure to sunlight causes plastics to degrade and to release greenhouse gases, which are widely acknowledged to contribute to climate change. Despite this, there can be some advantages to using plastics when compared to alternative materials. For instance, the production process is less energy intensive and using plastics as a building material, particularly in vehicles, results in a lighter weight structure which requires less fuel and therefore creates lower emissions. In this project, we're aiming to use microbes and microbial consortia for the efficient degradation of PET plastic. Additionally, we aim to use the resulting degradation products as a microbial feedstock to generate products of added value. 
To achieve this, we have several objectives to meet. Firstly, to engineer microbial strains to produce enzymes which are capable of pet degradation. Secondly, to characterise the activity of these strains to select the most efficient candidates. And next, to investigate the potential benefits of multi-strain or multi-enzyme systems with the aim of designing effective microbial consortia. Additionally, we're testing microbial strains for the ability to use pet degradation products as a sole carbon source. And finally, we're using active lab-directed evolution to promote the evolution of desirable traits. The expected benefits of our approach over existing methods currently used to process pet waste include the ability to carry out a recycling process at a mesophilic temperature, which is suitable to permit microbial growth. These lower temperatures will have a lower energy requirement compared to other methods that require heat for the recovery of PET, and therefore making the end process less energy intensive. We're also aiming to use the monomers resulting from plastic degradation as a microbial feedstock to provide a carbon source for microbial growth. And in turn, microbes will convert degradation products from waste plastics into higher value products with a longer lifespan. For example, insulating materials or waterproofing materials, which will have additional environmental benefits. Microbial strains can be engineered to produce a range of beneficial products, including medicines, novel materials and bioplastics. And finally, by employing microbial consortia, tasks can be divided amongst different individuals within a community, which will reduce the metabolic burden. This opens up the possibility to use microbial consortia as a means to process mixed plastic waste, which is usually unsuitable using the existing chemical recycling methods. PET is a relatively new to nature material, and as a result, naturally occurring mechanisms to degrade PET are scarce. However, in 2016, a bacterium was discovered in a recycling plant in Japan in soil which was heavily contaminated with plastic waste. This strain is known as Edinella sacchiensis, and it's a mesophilic organism with the ability to degrade PET and to utilise PET as a coal sub sole carbon source for growth. The genes responsible for this process have become popular candidates for enzymatic PET degradation. However, although Edionella is capable of degrading PET, the process is not hugely efficient due to the relatively low growth temperatures that the organism can withstand. PET has a glass transition temperature in excess of 65 degrees centigrade, and at temperatures above this, polymer strands become softer and more viscous, and that then that makes them more accessible for enzymatic degradation. However, these high temperatures are too extreme to permit the growth of Edionella sacchiensis, and therefore enzymes which perform at a higher temperature are also desirable for this process. Another source of enzymes for microbial degradation of PET are the thermophilic organisms, specifically those that are found in decomposing plant material. Organisms found in these environments are tolerant to higher temperatures and they also produce cutinase enzymes which are capable of degrading the waxy cuticles found in plants. These enzymes are capable of hydrolyzing ester bonds that are found in plant cuticles, but they've also been shown to have activity to degrade ester bonds found in PET due to the similarities in structure of these two materials. In this work, we're using a range of mesophilic and thermophilic enzymes, as well as some engineered variants. The candidate microbial strains which we're working with were isolated from several environmental locations at the University of Surrey campus, and strains were selected for their ability to utilise PET monomers and growth at higher temperatures. All isolates have been sequenced to determine their strain identity, and we've also screened the genomes for gene clusters or genes of interest that relate to PET monomer metabolism and bioplastic production. We're also interested in genes that relate to antibiotic sensitivity so that we can assess the risk posed by these isolates. We want to ensure that the isolates we're working with do not have extremely high levels of antibiotic resistance as it makes them less safe and also more difficult to engineer. So the first step was to engineer isolates to express enzymes for pet degradation. We used a secretion leader that we fused to the end terminus of a hydrolase genes that we're interested in to permit the secretion of expressed proteins from the cell. Genes have been cloned into a broad host range plasmid 
and they've been delivered to our environmental isolates using conjugation for candidate state strains. We've engineered um, plasmids with this range of genes from different sources and for different um, intended purposes. We then to assess the activity of these engineered strains and initial activity screens have been performed to evaluate the activity of candidate enzymes. We developed assays which could be performed in a high throughput format using a 96 well plate and initially we tried to look at the degradation effects on two different proxies for PET. One is polycarprolactone and the other is p-nitrophy nobutyrate. Initial screening looked at the activity of enzymes that were secreted by E. coli against these two proxy substrates so that we could get an idea of the relative activities. Um, we looked to compare the activity across different substrates, between different enzymes and across a temperature range. In both assays, we observed that there was greatest activity from thermophilic enzymes, although there was little temperature defendant effects were observed. Polycarprolactone is, um, creates a cloudy appearance, so as the polymer is degraded, we can see a reduction in absorbance. P-nitrophene albutyrate, on the other hand, creates a yellow colour as a result of esterase activity. So in this instance, we're looking for an increase in absorbance to indicate greater activity. Polycarprolactone is not recognised as a substrate by the Edionella petases due to a lack of an aromatic ring. So we were unable to see activity in the PCL assay when we look at the Edionella petases and the modified versions. However, p albutyrate assays were able to detect this esterase activity in both the Edionella petase and some of the engineered variants. Following initial analysis of enzyme activity using proxy substrates, we moved on to access in vitro degradation using PET films. Selected environmental isolate was chosen and this was tested using strains which were expressing each enzyme of interest. Our strains were grown in minimal medium with the addition of glucose as a sole carbon source but also squares of PET film were added to the culture tubes. These cultures were then monitored over a two-week period and we were able to monitor the um, accumulation of PET degradation products. So when PET is broken down, it forms four potential monomers. These are known as BET, MET, TA and EG. And due to the presence of these aromatic rings, we're able to detect their accumulation by taking absorbance readings. We'll also examine the PET films further using scanning electron microscopy and HPLC to look for evidence of surface degradation and um, the presence of monomers respectively. The results of these assays indicated that there was some accumulation of an aromatic release in some of the cultures that are expressing peptidrolases, particularly the thermophilic enzymes, which are TF-CUP2, TCA, and LCC. We saw an increased absorbance over the two week period of which these were monitored. We saw activity in the Eginella variants to a far lesser extent and no activity in our wild type strain, which was untransformed. The PET degradation, however, was quite weak and um, we still had PET films present at the end of two weeks, although there was evidence that these had been degraded to a certain extent. We also may have observed some potential spontaneous degradation as can be observed in this TF-CUT2 mutant strain, which is an inactivated version of the TF-CUT2 gene. So we're still working to further optimise this particular protocol. Another consideration of this work is whether or not microbial consortia may allow more efficient degradation of PET. The rationale here is that tasks are shared between individuals to reduce the metabolic burden. And this may involve multiple strains producing different enzymes to allow PET degradation, or even the division of PET degradation and subsequent monomer consumption between different individuals which can establish stable cooperation. Work by Greg Beckham's group last year demonstrated the benefit of combining PETases and metases to enhance PET degradation activity. 
So we attempted to combine metes with the different petases of interest and repeated the two assays using proxy substrates. In this instance, we observed little benefit to including metase in addition to our other PET hydrolases in these conditions. And we potentially observed a dilution effect in the p-nitrophenol butyrate assay, where we actually saw less activity when metase was included. So further work is ongoing to investigate combining different enzymes and also to optimise these assays further. Additionally, we're interested in sharing the roles of the pet degrader and monomer consumer, so we've also investigated the ability of environmental isolates to utilise pet monomers as a sole carbon source for growth. If strains can grow using pet monomers as a sole carbon source, then pet degradation products can serve as a microbial feedstock in the synthesis of new products. And this process is key in establishing a system to upcycle pet waste. Pet degradation results in four monomer compounds, so we tested the growth of our environmental isolates using each of these four individual carbon sources. Our results indicate that the growth on terephthalic acid is relatively common amongst environmental isolates. However, growth on the remaining three monomers was not observed. It's possible that um, if we were to test our transformants that are expressing enzymes, then they may be able to utilise these, particularly those that are expressing a metase enzyme. We're also using active lab-directed lab evolution, also known as ALE, to promote the evolution of desirable straits, specifically microbial growth on PET monomers. This is the experimental setup we use, whereby we've taken a strain that lacks the ability to degrade terephthalic acid and we have introduced it to a culture medium which has terephthalic acid as a sole carbon source. We are then subculturing this in three day intervals and this should allow the strain to become more adapted to terephthalic acid and evolve the ability to use this as a sole carbon source. So we've established cultures with prolonged exposure to terephthalic acid and tested them for their growth rates and we can see that cultures which have undergone further exposure, shown here in dark green, has a higher growth rate than the less adapted strain. So successive rounds of subculturing have improved growth on this particular carbon source. So to summarise our results and conclusions to date, we've isolated candidate microbial strains and engineered these to express pet hydrolysis enzymes. We've carried out activity screens and compared the um, performance of different enzymes. And we've also begun to investigate the possibility of using dual enzyme systems to enhance degradation activity. We've also identified strains which are capable of using PET monomers as a sole carbon source. And we've used active lab directed evolution to evolve the presence of desirable traits. So we conclude that environmental sources provide very promising strains for engineering for these applications and isolates can be modified so that they can secrete enzymes for the degradation of PET. Strains can utilise PET monomers which will allow them to permit upcycling of degradation products and we can ultimately um, result in an approach which combines engineering and evolution which can then be applied to the circular pet economy. So we envisage that there is several impacts of this work which will relate to climate change. Firstly, if pet waste can be processed using a mesophilic microbial system, this will reduce the energy requirement significantly compared to current pet recycling methods. Secondly, this work will enable the conversion of pet waste into products of added value including those with further environmental benefits, such as waterproofing or insulation materials. Microbial systems would also be capable of processing mixed plastic waste, which would allow materials which are currently entering landfill to be recycled and for valuable constituents to be recovered and reused. And finally, by reducing the amount of PET entering the environment, there will be less release of greenhouse gas emissions resulting from incineration and degradation resulting from sunlight exposure. I'd like to end by thanking my supervisor, Dr. Jose Jimenez, members of the My Place project, and the students who have contributed data in this presentation. 
I'd also like to thank the Society for Applied Microbiology for the opportunity to present in this webinar series. And finally, thank you very much for listening.